Cashamaniacs. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to Geo Gearheads. If you're brand new, and we hope you are, if you're old, we like you too, because it's more like us. This is Geo Gearheads. This is a weekly show about geocaching and geo related or geolocation related games. I am Chris of the Northwest, along with our host, Daryl W4. Daryl, how are you doing this week? Yeah, much better than I was a couple of weeks ago. And, oh. you know, I really enjoyed having the day off mm -hmm. uh, for uh, last week's show. And we're well, talking about old. That episode was uh, uh, pretty fun to go back and listen to part of. Unfortunately, I didn't get to listen to the whole thing. I, I swore I was going to try, but I just couldn't find the time to listen to the whole thing. Yeah, that happens. And it was an hour long show. Wow. Which, you know, is not uncommon for us, I guess, but no, no, it's easy to go an hour, you know, we can go an hour and then suddenly look up and go, Oh, Hey, it's been an hour. We should probably close this. Yes. So but yeah, it, it was an interesting uh, show from the little bit that I caught and it's like, I forgot how much the production has changed since, uh, the beta shows. Yes. Until yes. I opened up those files and started looking at it again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it lets people know that we evolve as a show. Hey, well, I did take care of most of the uh, issues that we've addressed since then in post. So Tell hopefully me what it was. Well, the big thing that I changed in my uh, workflow was doing the normalization after the mix down mm -hmm. because we were having some issues with some hot uh, spikes mm -hmm. in the audio. So I do another uh, audio compression after the mix down. Mm -hmm. That makes it nice and even and smooth, so it's better for the cars. Because we like smooth podcasts. Well, and we know how many people are listening to this in the car. It just happens a lot. And even on the trail, if you're listening, right. it makes it easier. Well, it might make it sound a little bit flatter and unnatural, but it makes it so that you can understand what we're saying easier. And if you've talked to us in person, you realize we are flat and un unnatural in person as well. Yeah, we're we're much flatter and less natural in person. <laughs> you know, I've had several people tell me, you sound just like you do on the podcast. So, Daryl, you do good work. I just heard this week there are 700,000 podcasts being produced right now. So, wow, we thank you for listening to this one. You know, that's so many podcasts that even though those were like just a minute long, you still couldn't even listen to that in a week. Nope. You could listen to like six of them at a time. Okay. Then you might be able to get to it. <laughs> wow. Anyway, we're happy to be back this week and we're coming back with a show that a lot of people have been uh, clamoring for, which is the GPSR versus smartphone. So we figured since we had uh, some pro smartphone feedback, we'd bring in one of our friends, Limax, who tends to be a little bit more uh, pro GPS. Just a little bit more? Just a little bit more. Hey, you actually still use the smartphone. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But um, yes, I also always have a GPS going at the same time. Yeah, I know about that. That's what I've been doing recently. Um, and I think my smartphone got jealous and has been far more accurate since I started using my GPS. Okay. Well, you know, my Is that the way it works. I don't think so. Maybe I'm attracting more signal to me, more GPS signal at the moment because I'm using two devices. Mm, no. No. Oh. Well, I do know that, that might actually uh, uh, cause more problems too, yeah. though. <laughs> it's true. What were you going to say, Limax? Well, what I was going to say is I know I've been doing a lot more um, smartphone caching lately, also as I've been helping my girlfriend, uh, Pippa Bear, get up to speed with um, geocaching as well. Mm -hmm. She's almost hit that magical three digits. Um, oh. Thought we were going to get it at, up in Copperopolis, but um, the sun conspired against us. Copperopolis? Yeah, Copperopolis, California. Is that the city made entirely of copper? 
Uh, it's actually where copper was discovered. It was a it, really there was copper mining up there that was then used for munitions uh, as far back as the Civil War. I had no idea. Now, if it was Leadopolis, Superman couldn't see anything. That's correct. But but Copperopolis, he can still see through copper. So yes, he can be an issue. All right, let's get back to some uh, feedback because we've You're got uh, a good little note for uh, GSM Times 2 here. Uh, both for the win, I didn't throw out my core to drill when I bought my cordless drill. I used all the tools in the toolbox. So I want to know, is he using them all at once? Why not? Hey, I so just... You, you, how are you going to get the two drill bits into the same hole? Okay, well, the... Yeah. Angles. Yeah. To say angles, you could. That's what I was afraid of. You could alternate. Um, that's not are... how you're supposed to make tapered holes. I had to drill through some tube steel this week, and you know you can do it with the corded drill. It doesn't quite have the speed, so I got out the or the cordless. I apologize. So I got out the corded drill and just went to town. You know, you can you that motor's a little little more durable. You can put a little more pressure behind the drill and pop on through so yeah, yeah definitely don't get rid of those corded drills you're gonna want them one day and yeah, well and i had to replace mine because i didn't have one. Oh, i wait, had one that no, burned out there you can't replace one if you didn't have one daryl well no i mine burned out okay and i didn't replace it and then one year it was like these cordless drills are killing me i'm just gonna go buy a good corded drill mm -hmm. and they're remarkably expensive yep <laughs> but you can't get like the cheap corded drills anymore, it seems. Oh, you can. I I got one at Harbor Freight a couple of years. I was ago. just gonna ask, did it is it a uh, uh, Chicago I electric? I I returned it and she says, Oh, it doesn't go in reverse. I said, No, it doesn't go in forward. You know, and the next one I got worked fine. Um <laughs> Uh, apparently she, a lot of them, you know, wouldn't work in reverse. Mine, mine wouldn't work forward, but I just use it as a screw gun, you know, for light duty jobs. It's got a battery that, you know, is not going to do much, but. Oh no, we're talking the corded ones though, not the cordless. This is a, did I say corded? This yes. is a cordless. Yeah. The cordless ones you can get really cheap. Yeah. Yeah, I was at Ikea and I almost bought one of their uh, little cordless drills because it was like $22. And it's not a bad little thing, but mm -hmm. for $22, it seems like, uh, you know, you can't go wrong. And it's just a nice little almost disposable tool. Carry it with you when you need a uh, uh, power driver or whatever. And exactly. Don't need to worry about accidentally leaving it behind or dropping it and bursting into pieces like uh, there you go. a code junkie does. Anyway, getting back to the actual topic of GPS oh. versus smartphones, GPSRs versus smartphones. So corded versus corded, cordless. Is well, they're all cordless. Kind of oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I, phone I'm, versus phone taking. less. I'm sorry, what was that, Limex? I said it depends on which path you're taking. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Well, and I guess maybe the little dots that we're leaving on the uh, GPSR screen, those tracks, maybe that's actually a cord. I, I look behind me. I never see them. But I see I them on the map, but not on the trail behind me. I don't know how. Oh, the worst I, part is I was training someone like uh, over a decade ago, I think, about how to use a GPS. And they kept looking for where is you know, where are these dots? It's like I can't find the green highways. That the That's where we walked. Yes, but I'm looking where we walked, and I don't see the dots. Mm -hmm. So is that cord with two O's? Yes. <laughs> Corded and cordless. Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, the type of geocaches. Oh, that was really good. Yeah, that was actually Can we have Limex on again? I mean, oh, for we'll, the have, one, we'll have Limex on, on again. Right there. It's worth it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, it's going to be one of those nights, isn't it? Uh, but in any case, on. when <laughs> when we're looking at the uh, uh, GPSR versus smartphone thing, I've actually kind of changed my opinion back toward GPSRs recently because it seems so many people have been having more of those uh, problems with the uh, uh, locations on the G uh, the smartphones than we've seen since you know, like. The 2008 2009 era 
Daryl, it's a good thing I was already sitting down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that said, I almost never take out my GPSR. <laughs> well, there you go. Said 10 years ago. What was that? Just like you said 10 years ago. Or actually, no, it was seven years ago. You said that exact same thing on the old podcast. Did I? Okay. Yes. Wow. It, it, you said it's around your neck. You're usually pulling it up to read the description, and everybody else had found it already. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, and that's, I, I don't even take it anymore. I used to take it all the time. Now I don't take it. I don't even bother. I really want to, but it's like I never use it. I'm addicted to the smartphone for a whole variety of reasons. So I never pick up the GPS. I'm sorry? Instagram and uh, Flappy Birds. No Flappy Birds. No. Sometimes Instagram. Sometimes uh, uh, YouTube streaming. Angry Birds? Nope. Candy Crush? Nope. That may be all the games I know. Pokemon Go? Oh, Pokemon Go, yeah. But I have totally given up on uh, Harry Potter. Yeah. So Ingress? that one's not even on there. Ingress, I have not played in ages. I kind of gave up on Ingress with Harry Potter. Because it's like, I, I already play too many games. I got to give up on mm -hmm. something. So I gave up on Ingress. Because Ingress, around here at least, has pretty much died out, it seems. Hmm. So Harry Potter... I got into it. I wish I got into it. I tried it for about two and a half, three months. And I finally got so annoyed at it that I just deleted it. Wow. Uh, Ingress is still going strong here. In fact, I, just this week, I think I saw both factions, uh, our local factions, you know, have their own logos. I've seen those on cars just this week. <laughs> I've actually still seen a lot of those logos, but they almost always have uh, one of the uh, uh, three teams for Pokemon Go as well. Yeah. So hey, you know. uh, Scott, GSM times two wants wants to know, Daryl, can you send me any Oregon models you want to get rid of? See, that's the thing. I never get rid of my GPSRs unless they're toast, mm -hmm. or unless I lend them to someone and they never come back. So lend GSM times two, one of your Oregon models. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I might have to Got send it, my 750 because, you know, that one really annoys me. Yeah. But I have, I have not retried it since uh, uh, the code updates, the firmware. Mm -hmm. So I really want to get back and try that. Uh, one's superior anyway. Which one's that one? The Magellan? That's the Magellan. Yeah, I like the Magellan. Uh, I had the uh, GC that I actually used as my um, kind of backup because it, it had the uh, Surf 3 chipset when everything else had to dump it. And it really worked well. However, the software at that point was a little bit buggy. Yeah. So it, it was kind of a rough one. Well, this one, this one actually is on its way out. It's not waterproof anymore. Let's see if I can... Uh, the there you go. There, right there. That's the power button. Oh, um, that doesn't work so well. No, it doesn't. No, there, well, there's, why do there's you do a, that? It still works, but I mean, you know, quite a bit of the rubber's gone now. Duct tape. Uh, yeah, or something. I mean, it's definitely not waterproof. I mean, it still turns on and everything, so I'm fine with it. But uh, you, you've seen the the commercials on TV where the guy sprays the stuff. And it makes a screen door waterproof. Just spray that on your GPSR. What could go wrong? I can't think of anything that could go wrong with that. No. And uh, make sure you get the screen too. It since it's an older screen. Yeah. Houston, Texas, Dave says that the uh, GPSR is a good backup when you're uh, out off the grid. I'm not going to contest that, but I, I would say it would be the primary when you're off the grid. Well, I. Yeah. I, yes. Cash everything. Yeah, there, there's so much that you can do with a smartphone to cache it if you have the right software. And Granted, you ahead. Yes, exactly. But it requires planning ahead. I was gonna say you need no, the but it requires planning ahead if you're going to go out with a GPSR anyway. Right. The GPSR forces you to plan ahead. Right. Um, and that's the big difference, Yeah, I think, when you're going off-grid mm -hmm. is it takes less work to make a gpsr good off-grid 
Right. You can make the smartphone do well off grid. You have to go cache all the maps, Mm -hmm. download the maps. If you're using one that does it, cache all your caches. And then you have to go and do things like turn off your uh, uh, cellular connections. Right. Because if you're actually off grid, it's going to suck down your battery trying to find a data connection. Right. So, um, and that's something you can do, you know, if, if you're heading off grid and you realize I didn't do any of that, pull over at a coffee shop, you know, take 15, 20 minutes, drink your coffee, use the facilities, cache all your maps and, and um, finds, and then you'll be ready to go. And likewise for the durability and waterproof, it, I have not found that uh, the current lines of GPSRs are as good as some of the old ones. <coughs> right. You know, as far as the seals and whatnot go, like, you know, Lime actually were just talking about that. Uh, and actually GSM Times 2 has the tip that some people are using hot wax to fix those buttons. It seems like a lot of those buttons are going bad right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what happened. You know, my, my old um, 310 that I used, well, I only actually used it to find my first 10 caches, but you know, the button, you know, ripped off of it. And I'm not sure if there was a connection inside that button, but that, that particular GPS just doesn't work anymore at all. You know, two digits of accuracy, who knows? (laughs) Uh, GSM times two says, Oh, good idea about turning off the phone functions. That's worth the price that I paid for the show. Oh, so we're glad to give you your values worth and hopefully we'll give you some more value so that you, you feel like you're paying, you're getting more from the show than you paid for it. That's oh. always our goal. Yeah. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, caching dead New York, uh, says smartphones have the most up-to-date GPS tech compared to the older GPSRs. We upgrade our phones every few years. Not so with the GPSRs. Uh, he doesn't know me, does he? No. <laughs> But on average, I think that's accurate. Most people well, tend to keep their uh, GPSRs for about five years. Mm-hmm. And on average, the turnover on cell phones is actually declining again. Yes. So it's oh. two and a half years is the last number that I heard. With the huge price increase in cell phones recently yes. that stopped people from yep. upgrading. So um, it was every... Uh, um, two years was the normal and it had started to shrink mm-hmm. to, uh, uh, I had heard one number like every 20 months. And then when they started coming out with these thousand dollar plus phones, now it's up to uh, 26 months, I think year and a half. It would be more than that. Wouldn't it? Um, but yeah, I don't remember what it was, but you like roughly a year and a half is what they're saying. We're currently at, and it looks like that's creeping up they're actually expecting to find three years is the normal uh, cycle now for smartphones. Now, Limax, I'm going to ask you about your uh, GPS satellite knowledge. Okay. Um, We don't really need to update our GPSRs, do we? Because the satellites are, you know, now we're just getting GPS three satellites into orbit and, and on the grid. Or in the constellation, if you want to refer to it that way. Um, That's how I'd refer to it, yeah. But that doesn't, I mean, even with the new satellites, the old GPSRs are still going to work as long as they can get that almanac data. Yeah, that's right? correct. I mean, as long as you've got the almanac data, uh, GPSR is a GPSR is a GPSR. I mean, that Magellan, you know, that's been, that's been through the uh, the war a few times there. I mean, that's actually, that thing's six years old, I think, is how old that one is. Um, but, you know, if you can get the new Almanac data, it's going to be fine. It's going to work. And um, it'll be good. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I would yeah. like to post a caveat to that, though. Please. The new L5, is that what they were calling it? L5? Uh yeah, radio. L5's, L5's a new free, the uh, new band they've uh, right. It's new TV bands free. that uh, is only right now available for uh, Galileo, and it's not available yet from the GPS three. But right. that you're not going to be able to do. No, that's so, true, and yeah. we don't even know how well the L5 is going to work with Galileo yet because Galileo keeps having trouble Issues. with yeah. their uh, with their um, constellation and. 
you know, I, I have I have yet to see, at least here in the states, a, a Galileo compatible um, GPSR. I mean, of course, we've got GLONASS compatible. You know, the actually, I think yeah, my Oregon one. here does uh, does GLONASS as well. Yeah. Although we found out there's a problem with that with the uh, GPS map. 64s if i remember correctly and some of the other garments right and and that's a really good point is an older gpsr may not be able to work with the multiple systems that we have now uh bay is it baidu baidu yeah Baidu Baidu is what i've heard yeah uh magellan glonass and what what, what's the u.s system called just gps just gps GPS, yes global positioning system yeah yeah, which is why GNS is actually the correct term for all of these. GNSS. Yeah, yeah. GNSS. Yeah, Global Navigation Satellite System. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I keep forgetting the second S. Yeah. Uh, but uh, GSM times two asks if there's a difference in the GPSR chip and the smartphone chip. There definitely is in processing. Well, I'm. He's talking. I think just about the GPS receiver. Not the receiver. The I- actual chip, and. Yes, there is, and it depends a lot on which smartphone you have because the GPS receiver is actually built into the uh, uh, modem chipsets on a lot of those. So your entire cell phone, including GPS, is in one chip, and then you have the rest of the computer that ties into that. Mm -hmm. So that has caused problems, especially uh, noted on... uh, uh, Verizon and Sprint, the CDMA carriers in the U.S., there was a period of time where you were told, don't expect a good signal because the radios in those particular devices bleed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the cell phone will actually interfere with your GPS. Yeah. yeah. Of course, if you really want gold school, you could go with something like this here. There, there you, go. you go. Yeah. Now, now, what chip does that have in it? Uh that's just got a single chip. That's actually um, calibrated for this area here. It's it, um, there are ones that have multiple plates, but this is this is a single plate. For those people who don't know what I'm holding up, this is an Astrolabe uh, that's ac- that was actually used for ship navigation. Um, I've had a couple, you know, a couple small lessons on how to use it, although I'm still learning. It's one of those things I've always wanted to learn, just to have the knowledge. Yeah, just yeah. You know. And, you know, you can put an address in there and, you know, that's what FedEx uses to get to your house. Most like, I thought it was DHL that used it, but. Oh, okay. Yeah. You but, know, the uh, ones that um, never show up, those are the ones that use it. Right. Uh, yeah. I picked this, I actually picked this up at the, uh, the Dickens fair. Um, really? Last, uh, last Christmas. Right. Nice. Yeah. Uh, we do. Now we were talking about cell phones and there's a uh, comment here from Code Junkie that says, I just paid $52 for a new battery. Uh, from in Geek Squad in my iPhone 7. Nearly good as new and works great. So I don't see spending a thousand plus on a new phone. And you know, that's that's exactly right. If you update battery, replace the screen if it gets cracked or whatever. I- anytime you have to replace the screen, consider replacing the battery. They've already got it open. They'll toss it in there for a couple more bucks. And um it's worth it. And you come back, you go, wow, I've got a my phone feels new and you know, there you go. Uh, Code Junkie wants to know what that was. An Astro Labe, L-A-B-E. Yeah, L-A-B-E. Yeah. I've got a sextant somewhere, too. I don't know where. I don't. I'm not sure where it is at the moment. <laughs> I don't know if we can talk about that on a fam- family-friendly podcast. Yeah, on the uh, cell phone uh, front. That's actually one of the reasons why a lot of people have been uh, complaining about uh, the upgrade cycle and the price, because the, uh, in general, people aren't thrilled with the new phones that are coming out. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, they well, like the better cameras. They like this, that, and the next thing. Mm-hmm. But the rumors from fairly good sources are saying that the new iPhones for 2020 may actually bring back the button which I don't see that happening, but that's one of my big complaints. Bring you know, my I, back button back. I button. love my touch ID. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I've got a friend who just um, had to get an iPhone X and um, he hates 
face face ID. Well, and if you have the the ten face ID is nowhere near as good as it is on the ten S or on the eleven. So that you know, it was a first generation product. We'll give it a little bit of room for that. But but I just don't like it. You know, I've got uh, a number of my uh, coworkers that have it, and the amount of effort it takes to unlock the phone doesn't really work for me, especially because you have to look at the phone. So if I need to look something up on the show here, I have to actually like look down at the phone to unlock the phone and then bring it up. So it, it doesn't really work. And I have the same problem when I'm doing uh, uh, zoom conferences at work because almost everything we do at work is on zoom and I don't want to take my attention away from the screen. So that's one of my big complaints with the face ID. That said, it does definitely work better on the 10 S to the point where I'm thinking I'm going to upgrade to the 11. But the next thing that they're talking about uh, for the 2020 phones is we're going to likely see the end of lightning on the high-end phones, and we're going to go to USB-C. Yay, standards. Eventually come out with something else. Uh, yeah, well, that's my worry is that we're going to get everyone finally switched over to USB C and then we're gone. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, and uh, Code Junkie said that he has the iPhone 10 uh, for work and the face ID sucked or had past tense. It's so much easier on the seven with touch ID. Yeah. yeah. And no. that's why I'm on my eight still. Well, and, and you know, if, you, if you're ahead, sorry, spending a thousand dollars for a phone and yours, you come like, when I first got my eight, uh, I was very disappointed with the GPS quality in it. And I'm like, well, I'm stuck with it for a couple of years. I'm not going to go buy another, you know, it wasn't a thousand dollar phone, but I'm not going to go buy a thousand dollar phone, you know, within a year of buying this one just to hopefully get a better GPS. What if it's no better? What if this is just, you know, how Apple products are from this point on, you know, that, that, that really limits your ability to switch, to investigate new products and, you know, explore. There. I'm done now. <laughs> and soapbox put away. <laughs> Got off my soapbox. <laughs> it wasn't a big one. <laughs> no. <laughs> which, which is good because it's only an hour long show. Okay. Well. <laughs> Should we read some email that we got? I was just going to say, we're, we've been talking so much about uh, smartphones. Let's get into the pro smartphone emails that we received. Okay. So pro smartphone, the first one comes from Tay Ken Cash. And with capital letters, I assume that's how it's pronounced. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I've been caching a little over two years and never have used a handheld GPS to cache with. I started using CGO with a basic membership and later started using the official geocaching app after I went premium and have found that as long as I save the geocaches to a list and download the offline data when I have service, then once I go out of service, I'm still able to access all of my cache info and it always navigates me right to the cache. I have also had good luck with getting coordinates for placing caches where there is no cell service using my Galaxy S10. I don't see myself ever using a handheld GPS, even for those rural areas where there is no service. I believe smartphones are the way to go. And he gives a thumbs up. Yeah, so that's uh, kind of where I was at for a long time. But not 100%. Waffling Daryl. Yeah, yeah. Well, just wait. Well, again, we've had these problems on and off with the uh, uh, location information. I had that one, I think it was the iPhone seven that was delivered with a non-functional GPSR. Mm-hmm. It had no location. And at that point, again, I was already at that, you know, you know, I really don't see a reason to have a GPSR. I got that one. It didn't work. And it's like, yeah, it, even after I got the new one, which was good, mm-hmm. it wasn't as good as my iPhone five had been. Gotcha. Which wasn't as good as the iPhone 4S. Which wasn't as good as the 3. No, it was the 4S was the best of them that I had. Nothing beat the 4S. And meanwhile, uh, Francis uh, is asking for GeoGearhead's recommendation list of their favorite uh, phone models for each platform. 
and the recommendation for the GPSR models. I don't know if we really want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> GPSRs, like, oh, I think, are pretty easy. Well, we have a tendency to pitch on this quite a bit. Let's tell people what we're using. Yes, I like this plan very much. There you go. So I have uh, iPhone 8. Um, and, you know, like just when I started the show, uh, a month ago, two months ago, I was very disappointed with the GPS performance. So I pulled out my old Oregon 600. I know it's not that old, but for me it was, right? It's it's the GPSR that I had mounted on my bike that was a very good biking computer because I'd pretty much given up using a GPSR for geocaching. Um, I pulled that out, updated it, and boy, I mean, I'm finding those caches right and left. And I have them going side by side. So one hand is the phone. One hand is the GPSR. And, you know, now I look at it, I'm back to the phone because I find that they're both just as accurate. But there was a time that my cell phone was 25, 30 feet off. And, you know, that's a pretty big radius to be searching uh, outside of a normal um, uh, G uh, ground zero search radius. So, you know, I was searching up to 50, 60 feet around trying to find these geocaches and I was just getting frustrated. Okay, Daryl, your turn. All right. For me, I'm still using the uh, iPhone 8 uh, GSM. Uh, and I still, despite all of the other GPSs that I've purchased since then and before that, my favorite one that I always go back to is the eTrex 30. That is just such a nice little package. And it does such a good job with the uh, location. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, the uh, 66 and the 64s are probably better. But as far as you know, a nice usable unit, it is just beautiful. Now, I do prefer my 62 for the buttons on it. But being that I don't really do too much on the unit itself... I prefer the eTrex for the size and the you know, compact case that it provides. Now, if we go for the units that we're kind of lusting for, I guess, it's going to be the uh, Pixel 4. Not the XL, but the 4. Everything I've seen from that phone is really impressive. So it that's if I were going Android, that's the one at this point that I would do. But... It, I would have to take a serious look. There was a Xiaomi phone that someone was... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually, not just... A, a few people have been talking about. I can't remember the model number. But it's relatively cheap, like under $500. And they just I almost bought one because it was like $250 on one of the Black Friday deals. Okay. You know, an unlocked... It's not a flagship phone, but it has very good specs for, you know... 250 bucks it's normally like you know 499 or whatever right and it was like wow if i if i had the cash to throw at it i would get one just as like a tablet right so yeah so you me to make some good stuff at a very good price um speaking of tablets if you get a tablet and you want to geocache with it make sure you get one with cell service or um data service well it, it, that's not One entirely true ability to get a that, well that's that's true with the iphones or with the ipads rather okay there are a lot of the cheap uh android phones that are android tablets yeah that have the gps okay and i've got one of the hundred dollar lenovo's from uh walmart that's like that and it's actually a pretty good unit for uh, geocaching okay just at eight inches that's a little bit big to take out in the field uh, yeah but you know, don't take it. It's well. great in the car. Yeah, there you go. Navigation to and from. Yeah, and, and actually, we didn't talk about that at all. I use a uh, iPad Mini with the uh, cell service as like my, you know, mobile caching computer. So I've got, uh, 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 I'm trying to call it Geosphere, but Cashly. Mm -hmm. Geosphere was the old one, uh, sure. but I've got Cashly on both, and then I can uh, share the. Uh, files back and forth between them, mm -hmm. send stuff around, do my planning, yep. do logging all from the iPad in the field, you know, whether I'm at the hotel or 
you know, at a uh, rest area, whatever, it just gives me so much more flexibility on a bigger exactly. screen, even though it's not a big screen on the, not, it's not a huge difference, but it's it an eight inch screen, which coming from the regular, uh, iPhone size, you know, the six, the seven, the eight mm-hmm. all have that, uh, what is it? 4.2 inch screen. Something. Or is it 4.7? But yeah, it's it's not the larger size. Mm-hmm. And I like that it's a smaller screen. Yeah. I don't like having the bigger phones, and I really like that. Limax, what are you using? Well, I'm actually also using an iPhone 8 um, that I use for uh, with Cashly on it. Uh, in addition, I do have Cashly on my iPad mini as well. In addition to that, I've got a Galaxy Tab A that I'm going to be trying to uh, integrate into what I'm doing. Um, as far as GPSs go, of course, the Magellan Explorers 510 is my go-to unit. Um, I do have a Garmin Dorsov. Oh, excuse me. Garmin Oregon 750T. Um, and then for caching in the car, I u- I've i just bought a uh, Garmin DriveSmart uh, GPS. Uh, mm-hmm. It had some features that my Nuvi did not, and I load caches onto it using GSAC, um, and I use it as my heads-up display. In fact, I know Chris Chris has seen me do that and thought I could see a cache from a long distance away because he didn't realize where I was looking. <laughs> How can you tell it's over there? <laughs> <laughs> nice. oh. and I wish that we had uh, integration uh, with most of these apps on uh, like iPhone and Android Auto so that we could actually use one app instead of have to switch back and forth. Right. But at yeah. least Google Maps on, uh, I think both on Android Auto and CarPlay, but at least on CarPlay does have the satellite view now. So that made a huge difference in my caching and that I can go to that pin and actually see, well, no, it's routing me wrong because I see the parking lot right there. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Code Junkie um, says that he has a, a Lenovo 10 inch from Walmart and it works great. He also uses a second monitor when uh, traveling uh, for work via an app mm-hmm. at about a hundred dollars. It was a great deal. Yeah. I actually do that same thing <laughs> using the uh, uh, tablet as a monitor. Yeah. Second monitor. It's, yeah, it, it is so it's handy. handy. Yeah. 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 I haven't found a new app that does that. I can't remember what was the old one I used, but it Duet is the one that I use that works on Android, yeah. iOS, and then it works with uh, Mac and Windows. Okay. Does it so work? I can recommend it. I didn't know that. Yes. It does work on Android. Okay. Or at least it did. You could use that on Limax on your Canadian Galaxy Tab. Oh, there we go. There we go. The Galaxy Tab, eh? A, yeah. <laughs> yeah, P- Pivot Bear's got a um, a Samsung sp- smartphone. I, she's got the latest model, and she's still currently using the uh, geocaching her app on it. Um, I haven't indoctrinated her into anything else yet. She's still, she and her daughter are still learning the ropes quite a bit here. Yeah. So, and, and that's a great app to learn on. It really is. Uh, you know, as, uh, experienced cashers, it's kind of gets in the way, but for the learner, I think it's a great app. Yeah. Which is where it came from. It came from the geocaching intro app. Yep. So, and that said, it's not a perfect app to teach someone anymore. Not that it was ever, I guess, a perfect app, but it's it's nowhere near the tutorial app that it once was. No. Um, so you still need someone else to help them out. Yeah, it made it it made it kind of difficult. And actually, part of the reason I picked up the uh, the Canadian uh, Galaxy was the fact that the interface was different enough between the iPhone and the Android version of the official app Mm -hmm. that I was having trouble telling her where to do certain things where I knew it was on the iPhone version. of Right. Yeah. Let's get back to some of the uh, emails though. And this one comes from lobotomy. I just wanted to write and give some love to my cell phone caching. I know some people may have trouble using their cell phones as GPS devices, but I'm not one of them. I cannot remember the last time I pulled out my GPSR. In fact, I'm not even sure where it is. During my extremely long daily streak, I have mostly used my phone to find the daily caches. Most of the time when hunting a uh, cache, I really use a device to get me to the area. Then I start looking for something that's out of place 
or matches the description. Maybe it's because I've never really trusted the coordinates to be precise. I do not know what device the hider is using or the uh, technique to get accurate information. I just assume it will be somewhere within a 20 to 30 foot radius. Using my phone allows me to carry less stuff, be ready to search for a cache at a moment's notice, and find all of the information about the placement. Plus, with a flashlight app, I can be following the arrow and lighting the ground at the same time. To be fair, the majority of my finds are in urban, sometimes rural settings, but even in the woods, my phone has rarely failed me. He makes some interesting well, points there. Yeah. Um, I remember actually referring to last week's episode where seven years ago's episode, however you want to refer to it. Um, well, one of the correct. things I, I can't remember if it was you that brought it up actually, or Andy, maybe Andy brought it up. Um, back then the cell phones were less accurate than the GPSRs, And there, there was some new technology that was coming on to make the GPSRs more accurate at that point. And, for all I know, it just could have been the, the two F satellites. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think there were new chipsets uh, that were coming out too. But uh, the interesting thing there is the flashlight to light the way. Yeah, my uh, Oregon 750T, also known as the Oregon doorstop, uh, has the uh, flashlight as well. So there, that's one of those things that you are seeing in cameras as well on a lot of the gpsrs now because it's not that tough for them to add it mm -hmm. and it's one less thing that uh, people can uh, argue in favor of a, a smartphone for so you know that's the way that goes <laughs> things do actually uh, change and we're seeing some improvements the problem is that's not what i want in my gpsr what I don't want the flashlight in the, uh, especially because a lot of the GPSRs run off of batteries, which is one of those advantages we haven't talked about yet. Mm -hmm. But because they run off of, re you know, replaceable interchangeable batteries, right? They're awesome on the trail because you can carry a, a set of lithium AA batteries for most of these units. I mean, you can carry any AA battery. You yeah, but you can, but you can take the. Going. lithium double a's that have a shelf life of 10 years or more they weigh so little and will power those uh gpsrs for mm -hmm. seven eight hours minimum right and always have the backup right so you know you've got an option for backup power with those that you don't have with the smartphones right and stop at any convenience store pick up your pick up another set of batteries if you need them you know you can get them anywhere although that's harder and harder to do is it really yes i, I was in, uh, in convenience stores lately yeah i was in uh, uh, a store about three or four months ago and i just wanted a couple of double a batteries for, or maybe it was maybe it was c batteries or something like that for see? a flashlight so i could see and they had no batteries. They're like, no, we don't have batteries anymore. But they did have the uh, USB chargers. Okay. I, I, I've been into some of the bigger stores. And, you know, they still have the battery kiosks where you go find what you need. Unless you're looking for one of the, you know, button batteries, pill batteries. And, of course, those, those are in the jewelry section. Yeah. yeah, yeah so you're going to be able to find, in most cases, the... Uh, uh, dry cell batteries, the alkalines or the lithiums. So you can usually find your uh, uh, power source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, so. um, I know convenience stores, at least the ones I'm going to, they have, have them behind the counter now, but they still have oh. them. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, I I have a feeling that they have may, have been, may have been walking off on their own. It, very possible. Uh, I wonder if it's also just they, you know, don't want to put uh, more valuable shelf space uh, for something like that that doesn't sell much right well i mean you got to have it for your tv remote yeah yeah <laughs> what else do you use batteries for these days All, although you know what was it uh mice and keyboards no no it was like uh one of the new tvs that uh, someone was talking about they got rid of the uh, batteries and it's a uh, rechargeable remote oh interesting yeah and apparently this is now a trend because people just don't like batteries anymore right and everyone you know, expects rechargeable you plug in your remote at the end of the evening and 
Well, and there's more and more phones or more and more TVs where they don't even come with the uh, remote. What? They're actually doing apps from the uh, phone. I don't like that. I don't either. I want some kind of physical control Mm -hmm. that's not on the TV, especially because you can't get to half of these buttons now because they're on the back. If it goes down, you can't use your, you can't change the channel on your TV? No, I think it's Bluetooth. Okay. But see, then that requires your phone there and your phone charged and, you know, working. Or tablet. Or something, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it has to be, you know, a, t- a phone or tablet if you have just like a computer and you don't have a smart device, which I know who who listening to the show would be in that crowd. But yeah, it, it causes some problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the new Apple TVs, I mean, um, it works very well with the TV app um, in addition, of course, to the remote. And you have to actually charge the remote yeah uh, right. which is a bluetooth remote yeah. same thing with the uh, fire tv and i believe all the rokus are i don't think any of the rokus have ever been uh, ir but i could be wrong hmm. but they've always been a, you know uh, rf uh, connection because that way you can put the box behind the tv right you don't need to see the box anymore Right. Right. There's nothing to see here. This isn't the box you're looking for. Wow, we are getting so far off topic on this. Are show. we really? Oh wait. <laughs> but hopefully people are finding it uh valuable because a lot of this does I think kind of overlap, which is how we get there in the first place. Yeah, I, we were um Piffle Bear and I were out geocaching up in Armstrong Woods back in June, I believe it was. It must have been, I think it was June. Um, that's up, uh, I think it's Mendocino County. It's, it's North of Marin is where that is. And, um, we were, we were actually trying to follow a letterbox that was using, um, images. I had used, um, I had downloaded everything ahead of time onto Cashly so that I would have it. Cause I figured we'd be out of cell phone range. I forgot to download the images at the same time, because of course that's not something that's turned on by default. Right. Somehow, with with the official app, she was able to get photos. I don't know how she managed. She's she's on Sprint. I'm on Verizon. Who knows? Sprint may have had something better up there. But uh, I I, th- I found that quite interesting. That I here I I had to rely on an Android on Sprint as opposed to my iPhone on Verizon, and it was just such an it was an interesting reversal for me and. I think actually that trip I didn't have, I I hadn't had the time to actually load up my GPSR. So we were doing everything by smartphone that time. And did you find it? No. Um, Oh, just read one of the pictures. Bummer. Um, We've been planning to go back up there, but uh, with with my health issues, it's just not been able to happen. Mm Mm-hmm. That's unfortunate, but I do like those. Code Junkie says, like the good old days, put a 13 position dial right on front of the TV. So, I don't know. Gentlemen, do you remember when you were the remote? I do. Yeah. Actually, your, your parents would say, go go change it to, cha- I remember channel 13. Well, yeah. I remember when we actually got the newer. Yeah. Well, and I remember when we got those newer TVs where you could actually push the buttons and it had the. Uh, knobs and pots under a, a secret panel where you could set what those channels were and oh, you had yeah. to push it just right especially as it started to get a little old or the whole thing fuzzed out <laughs> the, the kids tv was an old i'm not sure what brand it was but it was an old manual one my dad had built a heath kit for the uh for them oh, okay built the cabinet in fact to put it in and uh it had a remote it was it was um you could actually actually hear the noise of it and it was mechanical. So it would go ka-chunk, ka-chunk as it was going through the channels. Yep. Yeah. So all motor driven. Wow. wow. And do you remember the UHF dial? Oh, With, yeah. What yeah, did it, was, it go up it to? 62, uh, 67, uh, something like that? It went past 62, I think. Yeah. 73 is what I'm remembering. Maybe that's right. Maybe. 72, 73, 74, somewhere, somewhere in that range anyway so one of the you brought up the photos and that's one of those things that 
no matter what, the GPSRs are not going to be good at the smartphones on. That's and true. They don't have the screens. And part of the reason for that is exactly what we were just talking about with the batteries. They have to work with less battery power. So they have less hungry screens, which means also lower color quality, lower resolution, lower refresh rates, but it works very well for a GPSR and it saves power. Mm -hmm. So it's a trade-off. And for GPSRs, I don't want a good screen, if that makes sense. I want better screens than what we have. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want it to be a cell phone screen because if it is, then we need a heck of a lot better uh, battery in there than the double A's mm. that we're used to, which means it's losing one of those big advantages that it has. Yeah, for me having the GPSR, I mean, I'm used to just using it um, with a compass pointing in the direction I need to go. Um, I have to actually have topo maps on my Magellan as well now. Um, and that's just so I can know where the trail is. Um, I, I can't count the number of times I was in Massachusetts and went through a forest a long distance just because I wasn't sure where the trails were, hmm? you know, to reach a geocache. And for all I know, I was, you know, about this far off of the trail on the other end and I didn't know, but, uh, you know, with that, you know, I mean, you really don't need a good screen for that. And of course I've got, I have the in reach as well. Um, which is tied into the Iconos constellation. Um, and then I can, and that's the interface with my um, cell phone. I've actually tested it a little bit on some of the back roads around here. I still need to do some more testing because the text didn't come in right away. And I don't know if it's because of where Piffle Bear happened to be at the time. She was at her school and her school doesn't always have the best data connection, but uh I don't know. Um, could, I just need to do some more um, field testing with it. Yeah, and I do like those uh, in-reach uh, units or spot units, but in-reach especially seems like it's a more compelling option for the uh, geocachers. But just to have that as the backup, if you can afford to do it, I think it's probably worth doing. That said, I don't own one yet. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was a Christmas present. I think I think my family realized that I'm going to go off on these trails no matter what, so they probably thought I should have one. Yeah, you probably need to have it because you're going to get lost one of these days. Oh, yeah. But, uh, Eventually. That means they like you, Limax. Oh, they want you to come back. Oh, oh, does it mean that, or do they want him to uh, uh, hit that button and tell them where they are, where he is so that they can uh, go out and collect the uh, evidence? That might be it. I don't know. Maybe I guess they may still need me for um, uh, tech support. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, we should probably wrap this up because it's uh, getting close to that time. That magic hour. That magic hour when I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. Well, Limax, oh, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, we want to have you back on. Talk okay. about GPS stuff because that's what you really... You, you, you know, it takes a rocket scientist to understand this, and you actually are. So, well, I'm actually more of an engineer, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us again. And we, we love having you on, whether it's for uh, actual GPS technology or anything else. So, always great to have you on. Next week, we're going to be back, and we haven't actually come up with the uh, announcement of what the show is, but it looks like it's going to be another randomized show, and we'd love to hear your feedback on this episode, what you're using, whether it's a GPS, a smartphone, or both. Let us know, because that's going to help us out a lot and uh, you know help out your uh, fellow Geo Gearheads. But check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for show notes on this and all of our episodes we love hearing from our listeners so leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media your support helps keep the cashamaniac shows coming please consider becoming a patron through a link on our website to support the cashamaniac shows geogearheads is produced by chris Huffenauer and daryl wanberg this show is copyright 2019 by daryl wanberg 
All rights reserved. Cash with the Cash of Media. I still do it. Nobody sees it.